All right, Revelation 9, the appearance uh, of these locusts and the army that God is going to release uh, out of the pit. It's going to be it's going to be bad for the people of earth at that time. Uh, I was looking ahead a little bit. Uh, a YouTube video came up in my feed and it was one of these that was uh, it, it had a lot of graphics to it and you could tell that it was just trying to get people to notice it and they weren't actually quoting scripture they were just kind of going through uh, Revelation 9 and telling in their own words what would happen and, uh, and there were some things there that I just I knew they got wrong but if you look in uh, Revelation 9 15 there are four angels that are bound in the great river Euphrates and I'll explain what I can of that as we get into that some years down the road from here. But anyway, the verse 15 says the four angels were prepared, were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year. And notice this. What do they do when they come out? Slay how many men? A third of the, a third of the people on this planet are going to be killed by four angels. That shows you that they've got power and they've got power to kill. God's going to give them power. Um, the, eventually, when we get into verse 11 and look at the name of this angel who is the king over them, uh, his name is Abaddon and Apollyon, uh, that means destroyer. And there's 11 times when God mentioned the destroyer uh, I could expand that search and look at all the forms of the word destroy, destroy, destroying, but I won't do that. But he sends destroyers and they kill. That's what they do. They kill. They take men's lives. And everybody's worried about the climate and how the climate uh, is changing and how it's going to kill everybody on the planet and all that stuff. Don't buy that stuff. One, one congressman... He was doing a, uh, one of these uh, hearings Congress has with all these different people that are trying to get bills passed or get regulations done or whatever. And he had a whole panel of these environmental scientists. And he asked them all, each one of them, a question. It's a, a simple question. And he said, uh, he would go one by one. He'd say, Dr. So-and-so, do you happen to know the total amount of carbon uh, carbon dioxide that is in Earth's atmosphere right now, the percentage. And the guy said, no, I, I don't really know that. And he said, well, just take a guess. And the guy said, okay, I'd guess uh, maybe 5%. And he went down the aisle. None of the, none of the people, there was like five people on this, all esteemed scientists, who study the environment and none of them knew. They were all given numbers like 4%, 3%, 5%, 2%, things like that. But none of them knew the answer. And that's the issue, is that they're saying there's too much carbon dioxide getting in the atmosphere and it's going to melt the polar ice caps and we're going to lose California. And, uh, but, and it's all going to be bad. But he said... The congressman said, well, let me give you the number. He said, it's not 4%, it's not 3%, it's not 2%, it's not even 1%. It's 0.04%. And he said, we know that in order to sustain life on this earth, the amount of carbon dioxide has to be a bare minimum of 0.02%. So we're just 2.02% over the bare minimum of what would sustain life on this planet. Obviously, somebody's fooling with some numbers. But it's all scare you. Try to scare you into this, try to scare you into that. And then it's into money because all these companies are wanting, 
these government contracts. They're wanting to sell batteries. Uh, one guy said, do you know what it would take, the kind of battery that it would take to operate a city bus in like New York City, because they want them all to be battery powered. And uh, 8,000 pound battery it would take to run a city bus for one shift in New York City, the battery would, be, would weigh about 8,000 pounds. Yeah, so it gets almost to the point where the battery needed becomes heavier than the battery's ability to move the, its own self. Okay, that's what you get into. It's all about money and all about this. So a lot of people are, are trying to say, and, and, and let me say this too, there's a lot of garbage on the internet and it's all right-wing garbage about how they're trying to reduce the population of the earth down to 500 million people because that's on the Georgia Guidestones. Last I checked, God didn't write the Georgia Guidestones. God did not write any of that stuff. The last I checked, and they said, oh, it's Satan's master plan. He's going to get the, the, the elite want everybody killed off. The last I checked with Walmart, Google, Samsung, Apple, and Microsoft, they wanted more people on the earth. Why? More people on the earth buy more products and more things that most people don't need and they make more money that way. And it's just how it works. But anyway, if you look at the book of Revelation, the one who is responsible for the most deaths in earth's future is God Almighty. Not man, not the Illuminati, not Bill Gates, not uh, George Soros, not any of these people. I'm sure they've got crazy ideas, but God is the one who right here in Rev at the sounding of the sixth trumpet is gonna release just four angels. They're gonna kill one third of the men on the earth. That's that's the plain truth of it right there. And we've already had, going back to the, the first uh, seals, the first four seals, a fourth of the people are slain on the earth, right off the bat. So now we're reducing population very quickly. And it's not man that does it, although it is man's sinfulness that does it. Let me hear you say amen on that one. So in verse 9 of Revelation... Uh, nine. The Bible says they had breastplates and as it were breastplates of iron and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. Um, take your Bible, excuse me, and turn to Daniel chapter two. Daniel chapter two. Uh, whenever I see iron in the Bible, um, this is what I see, or this is what in my mind it takes me to. The four kingdoms uh, in the book of Daniel, in chapter 2, the, the ones that God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to see in his dream. Um, Somebody, while you're turning there, somebody asked me an interesting question this week. And I'll, I want to throw it out to you. I, uh, I have an answer of my own, but I want to hear you. Uh, we all dream. Usually we dream every night. Most of the dreams we don't remember. But some of you may have had a vivid dream. Has anybody ever had a dream where you uh, like called out to God in your dream or prayed in your dream or called to Jesus in your dream or anything like that? Anybody ever had one like that? Am I the only one? Am I the only spiritual person here? You have? You're, okay. Um, I can't tell you all the dream because it's so weird I can't describe it. But... I was like in this house of, you know that weird house at Silver Dollar City that's, yeah. yeah, it was in something like that. And I walked in this room and these creatures are like leading me through it. 
And as I'm walking through this room, the ceiling is getting lower and lower all the time. And I don't mean, you know, like built that way. I mean, it's like pushing me down. And I'm like, if it keeps going, it's going to crush me. And in my dream, I called upon the name of Jesus. Jesus help me. Jesus save me. And next thing I know, I'm out of it and I'm fine. So this person asked me if uh, uh, they sent me an email and asked me if, if it's possible to pray inside of a dream. And I, I know at least one and maybe two situations where I've dreamed I've had something like that. So you, you want to share yours or? Yeah. One that I was actually running across. You know, I lived in Rockford, Illinois, and I was running across a building. And I was running to get away from something. And I said, God help me. And, yeah. you know, and it began to where I didn't have, I just, I don't even know what happened. I just kind of started slowing down and stopped running. There you, you know? go. Well, that works. Uh, so, yeah, I just, I think, I'd say it's possible. Uh, the four kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream and uh, verse 42 and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken clay is always going to be uh, a symbol for mankind anything earthen or clay that's what man was made of and so in verse 43 and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men but they shall not cleave one to another even as iron is not mixed with clay so i always think of that iron kingdom and uh just sort of not really agreeing with a lot of modern scholarship or even early scholarship uh, I don't really believe that this fourth kingdom is any sort of revived Roman Empire. Uh, that's what a lot of the uh, premillennial dispensational teachers say, is that it's the Roman Empire revived and ruling over the earth again. I don't believe that. I believe that this fourth kingdom uh, is a kingdom of gods, devils, evil angels, um, that are coming down, they're, they're coming down from heaven, but they're also coming up from the heart of the earth. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's, that's kind of what I think uh, when I see iron. If you look in Joel chapter 2, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, you're just a few pages away from it. Hosea Joel. Yes. I would I would say if if I were to just take a literal interpretation, I, to answer your question, I would say, what is man literally made of? Clay. So what would these devils literally be made of? Iron. Iron Man, the Man of Steel. Oh, Thor. Yeah. If you want to do an interesting study, I did this a couple years ago. Study the what God says: the gods of gold, gods of silver gods of iron gods of wood um, study those and and just think of it literally what is lucifer made of in ezekiel 28 stones okay and they're all luminous stones that making him a lucifer but that's what he's made of and he's made of pipes and um, musical instruments that's what he's made that's his substance and fire Okay, fire. These made of fire. We don't quite understand that, but that's what the Bible's telling us. So I just like I like to see what what can we understand if we take a literal approach to this. Joel chapter two. 
Let's read there. I have verses 4 through 8 up on the screen, but let's go to verse 1. Uh, because Joel is so tied in with Revelation 9 and this fifth trumpet. There's a lot there. Blow you the trumpet in Zion. So right there, there's a trumpet connection. Sound the alarm, an alarm in my holy mountain. So we know that God had a specific trumpet that was to be blown as an alarm to the people that an enemy army was coming at them. Uh, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. And if you another study you can do is just study the phrase, the day of the Lord. Very, very interesting things. You'll see a lot of things there. The day of the Lord is a day of clouds and thick darkness uh, and so on. And here he says in verse 2, uh, which is up on the, uh, no, that's not up on the screen. Joel 2, okay. Joel 2, verse 2, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And that's not the only place God says that in relation to the day of the Lord. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. So this is a, uh, he's characterizing them as a nation, a type of civilization, something like that. A great people and a strong. And if you've got four angels that can kill a third of the men, that's strong. Uh, there hath not been ever the like. Neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Uh, in other words, we've never seen anything like this before. Never will we see anything after this. It's a one-time big event. A fire devoureth, verse 3, before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, behind them a desolate wilderness. This is what I... Uh, keep saying about the uh, the sodomite crowd that is ever growing and ever increasing in our land, and I, I will also say, um, in the past several years of going to Kenya, I've seen a difference over time. Uh, first time we went to Kenya, we never saw any of the young men with their pants pulled down. Never saw that. And I asked Michael about it. He said, oh, no, that, you never see that. Well, we're starting to see it now. They're starting to model uh, America is what they're doing. And uh, I didn't like it. I told him about it. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. Nothing. That means that the bunker that you built with your seven-year food supply in it is not going to escape them. And I follow a couple guys on YouTube. I, I think it's neat. I would like to have a bunker. I think it would be neat for some reason. I don't know why. But I have my, my upstairs bunker up there. I kind of like it. But this guy builds these real nice bunkers. Okay? Um, and with all these... Uh, air filters in it, generators that can run, water supplies, you know, all this dehydrated food. You've got all the comforts of home there, everything you would need uh, except for being able to go outside. That's a prison is what it is. He's building people prisons. But that's not going to stop this army. It's not going to stop them. Verse 4, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. That's Revelation 9. And as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, and as a strong people set in battle array. Um, let me ask, let me just ask a question this morning. Can I do that? Okay, I've been your pastor long enough. There's some things I can get away with, I think. Okay? Uh, this family in uh, Las Vegas last week that called 911 and said that a UFO had crashed in their, in their backyard. 
and that they could see it. Did you see that story? Okay. Is that even possible? Let me just ask you. George, you think it's possible? Okay. What do you think, Kyle? You don't know. I've got some videos you could watch. Okay. I got you. I got you. I was the kid. Uh, in fact, if you were to have been my age, you might have beat me up a couple of times. But because <laughs> she did. Uh, but I was the one reading Bigfoot books and UFO books and all that stuff. Okay. Fascinated by this stuff. Fascinated. But I had Christian upbringing, Christian teaching. And to me, there was only one possible answer that if there was these things flying around in the air and we're talking thousands of photographs, films, early films, um, 70s films, 80s and 90s videotapes, and now we're in the cell phone generation where everybody has the ability to record. Um, you have a lot of very feasible uh, videos. The, um, the Phoenix Lights, what was that, 1996, somewhere around in there? You had 10,000 people in Phoenix, Arizona that saw this massive, and I mean humongous, like a mile across, um, UFO at night over Phoenix. Even the governor of Phoenix admitted later that he saw it. He didn't admit it at first. He wanted to try to, uh, he probably felt under pressure to make this thing go away. So he held this news conference and said, we captured the people that was, and he, this guy dressed up like an alien came out with handcuffs and, and he was making light of it, but he made a lot of people mad and he has come out now in several, uh, several documentaries and said, you know, in hindsight, that was a really bad idea. He said, because I saw the thing. And he said, I wanted to know, he said, I got with my staff and I wanted to know what in the world was going on. We were calling the Air Force bases around saying, what are you guys doing up there? And at first they said absolutely nothing. Uh, they come out with a story two days later that they were dropping flares, but these were not flares that were falling out of the sky. They were stationary. And um, so we're talking, not, we're talking 10,000 people that saw it and we're talking probably a dozen or so people that actually caught it on video camera. So I like to tell people, this is not like I'm trying to tell you that Santa Claus is real and that we have actual footage of Santa Claus in the North Pole. We have footage of a, 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 a group of reindeer flying through the air, pulling a sleigh. We, there's, we don't have anything like, there's nothing like that. That's made up. But you have, now you have Congress having open meetings, talking with military brass. You have um, Congress forcing the Pentagon to um, begin a database so that um, American military pilots and American commercial pilots can report UFO sightings without being in fear of losing their rank, losing their pension, or losing their job. Uh, so they're taking it seriously. So there has to be something going on there. There has to be something that, if it's real, I believe that there must be a Bible answer to it. And that's, I guess that's how God just made me, because even as a young young boy, young man, I'm thinking, what are these? They have to be like devils or something like that. And that was what I believed when I was 12 and I still believe it. And now I think I can show it to you in scripture. Um, 
the idea that God has a chariot. In fact, he's got thousands of them, at least 20,000 chariots. That's, that's the book of Psalms. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. And when you look in Ezekiel 1, you have the description of one of God's chariots. And it's made of cherubims. And the wheels of this chariot have the spirit of the angels in it. So that it's like living. Um, when Solomon built his platform to hold the Ark of the Covenant in, the, in Solomon's temple, he made a chariot. If you go read the Bible, he put a, a crystal platform there, a firmament, and that was where the Ark of the Covenant was to sit, and then underneath that was two axle trees and four wheels on this thing made of gold. He made a chariot to hold the Ark of the Covenant in Solomon's temple, okay? So, does God need a chariot? No. But if you're the king of something, you don't ride around in a Volkswagen. Or a Yugo. Or a Pinto. Or what was it you had? A Maverick? It was Melissa's first car. It's a Ford Maverick. Piece of junk then, piece of junk now. And I made sure it was because I... Well, my first car was the Mustang. The what? I don't remember that one. Okay, yeah, the boat. My dad had a 1960 Chevy Impala with the fins on the side, and every now and then he'd let Melissa and me ride it to school, and everybody called it the Batmobile. Yeah, it did. All right, moving on. Um, like the noise of chariots, in verse 5, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, so shall they leap. You'll see chariots mentioned all through the Bible, and in some cases they move like a whirlwind. The angels in the chariot in Ezekiel chapter 1 moves as quick as lightning, meaning it has the ability to go from 0 to 186,000 miles a second instantly, stop instantly, and go back 186,000 miles a second without accelerating and without decelerating to a stop. That's not possible in Earth's physics, okay? But it is there. So, verse 5 again, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as the strong people set in battle array. You have the mentioning of the chariots, and then you have the mentioning of the people associated with the chariots. Deuteronomy 28 says they are a nation of fierce countenance. It also says that they speak a language that no one will understand. Verse 6, before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather together, shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. And that's another point that I have. You cannot beat devils with, with human flesh and blood weapons. Our weapons of warfare are not carnal, the Bible says. Verse 9, they shall run to and fro in the city. They shall climb upon the wall, they shall climb upon the houses, and shall enter in at the windows like a thief. If you study uh, anything about um, alien visitations, alien, what we call alien uh, abductions, um, the word alien does fit is because they are not from this world. They're from a different place. God says they're from the end of heaven. Okay, um, so they are strangers. They are alien to us. They don't belong here. Uh, but if you study uh, alien um, abductions and things like that, I've read dozens of stories where people said they were floated in and out through their window. Closed window. Okay, uh, the earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. Again, that is a description of what we saw in Revelation chapter 6, the opening of the sixth seal. It's what you see um, in Joel chapter 2. If you look at 
Verse 31, the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and no terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And I, I believe that this is God's one last chance. His invitation to everybody to call on the name of the Lord. I know people that die without the Lord, but I tend to believe that before they die, God gave them a chance. God gave it. Romans 1 tells us that. They're without excuse. God gave them a chance, and they just didn't take it. And so for that, they are punished. Uh, Daniel 2, I've already read that. We'll move on from there. Uh, turn to the book of Judges. By the time we get there, the bell will ring. Judges chapter 4. The children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now remember, this is type of, this is history, but it's also a foreshadowing. It's typology. It is foretelling, it's given you a, a picture of part of the big picture of what's going to happen. So in Judges 4, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Herosheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. See, there it is. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of what? Iron. It's exactly what we see in Daniel 2. It's what we see in Joel. It's what we see in Revelation 9. So I think they are connected. So imagine, uh, you know, our chariots and our military are tanks. Okay? We got these big tanks. But what if God sends an army to this world and their tanks or their chariots are not affected by our tanks? What if their tanks, their chariots, um, their machineries of war, um, are not in any way affected by ours, and yet theirs has the absolute power to take life, destroy property, destroy practically everything that man has. And that's what you're seeing here. The Israelites are clearly outpowered. They are outnumbered. 900 chariots of iron is a simple way of telling you um, that the children of Israel could not prevail against them. And 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. Uh, if you want something fun to do this week while I'm gone, study chariots in the Bible. Study, study the stories. Pharaoh came out with 600 chariots against the Israelites. Okay? Did he win the war? No. They're not going to win. Okay? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask your blessings upon this service. We thank you, God, for your word. Lord, open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts to the things, Lord, that are happening in this world. And Father, help us to see them clearly as we read through the sure word of prophecy that we have. Bless this morning's service, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.